have proximal Newton that we'll te I'll do either, we'll see how much we get to it today and then we'll spill it into next time. Um, next week, we have the option for doing two advanced topics. Depending on how long we want to spend on proximal Newton, it might turn into one advanced topic. I mean, these are all advanced topics. One more advanced topic or two more. So I'm going to see what people prefer because there are many things we could cover. Um, let's just see, let's take a vote. The, the options for advanced topics after these ones, Frank Wolf and Proximal Newton, are exact path following methods, non convex stuff, one lecture on non convex stuff, or one lecture on fast stochastic algorithms. Okay? So let's, um, just going off of those names, I know that's not that much. Uh, who wants to hear, you, just vote for one, advan one of those three as an advanced topic. Who wants to hear exact path following methods? And how about non-convex stuff? Okay, and the, the fast stochastic algorithms. Okay. Um, all right, so let me just clarify. The non-convex stuff is not going to give you general recipes for how to solve non-convex problems, just so that I didn't get your hopes up. The lecture I put together, I gave this lecture last year, it's a collection of all the non-convex problems that I know of that you can solve exactly. So it would be like a, you know, basically a survey of all these different non-convex problems that actually have global optima that we can compute. So it's not a lecture on, you know, some kind of uh, general non-convex algorithms. It's more of a survey lecture. So. Of those of you who voted for the non-convex one, how many people want to change it to something else, just so I can, OK? But that's only two. All right, so it looks like in order we'll do, if we have time, maybe non-convex stuff first. And then, uh, all right, great, thank you. That's OK, no problem. Yeah, OK. No worries. OK, so we'll do. Um, We'll do non-convex as a priority, and then we'll do uh, fast stochastic algorithms if we have time. Um, oh, actually, I wanted to vote one more thing, which is that uh, we, could, we could just skim through proximal Newton very quickly. So let's, let's do that. How many people prefer to hear two of those advanced topics in a quick proximal Newton, or a thorough, thorough lecture on proximal Newton, and we'll just get to one of them? So how many people want to spend more time on proximal Newton? OK, it's pr pretty grim. And how many people want to hear? The, the two other ones that I mentioned. Okay. All right, so I guess we'll go through proximal Newton quickly. Um, so let's finish up Frank Wolf. So where we left off, um, the Frank Wolf algorithm we learned last time, we thought of it as a, as a, a class of methods like gradient descent, right? That um, or a method like, that's, that's like projected gradient descent, I should say, that looks at a problem uh, of the form minimize some smooth convex function subject to a constraint uh, that x lies in some set c. By the way, if this, if this freezes on me as I'm writing, I can't actually see here, so somebody should get my attention. That was the problem. So if I'm writing and it freezes, please wave your arms or something at me. So projected gradient descent, remember, we thought of it as forming a quadratic approximation to the function and then projecting onto the constraints at every step. Frank Wolf does two things different. The first thing that's different is that it replaces this quadratic approximation to the function, this local quadratic approximation, with a local linear one. And the second thing it does differently is it doesn't project this unconstrained minimizer onto the constraint set, and rather solves for the linear minimizer over the constraint set. Okay, so th these are its steps. It, makes a linear extrapolation of the function, and it minimizes that over the constraint set, and then and it basically adds, you can think about it like it adds a bit in that direction each time. These are the updates. It either takes a convex combination of where we are and this uh, linear minimizer over the constraint set, or you can think about it like it takes our current iterate and it adds a bit in the direction suggested by this minimizer. The same thing. Okay. And these choices for these step sizes, I said you can think about them as fixed for now, but you can do them with backtracking. We'll mention it later. So that's the picture, right? 
So um, we saw that with norm constraints, the Frank-Wolf method reduced to um, define this minimizer. If my set C is the set of all vectors x, which the norm of x is less than or equal to t for some norm, this S, which is the linear uh, minimizer over the constraint set, it reduces to finding a subgrading of the dual norm. That's all, the cal all that's required. We went through this kind of very straightforward train of logic. So we find a subgrading of the dual norm multiplied by minus t. That gives us the form of the update. And we just add a convex combination of this. We take a convex combination of this and the, the point that we're currently looking at for our update. Okay, and the key is that this is often cheaper or simp simpler, or both, than projection onto the norm ball. Um, it's also important to say this is, this is often cheaper or simpler than, than the prox operator for the norm ball. Right, why is that relevant? Well, um, if you give me this problem, right, uh, or a problem where I I've want to minimize some function uh, subject to a norm constraint, the norm of x less than or equal to t, then in many instances, right, I don't, if I'm solving this problem in, say, a stats or machine learning context, I don't know an appropriate value of t, so I'm going to solve this over a wide range of t. If I'm doing that, then I really may as well think about solving the problem in its penalized form over a wide range of tuning parameters lambda. Because in either case, I'm searching for the kind of the, rate, the right amount of regularization. Right? We know that any problem like this is actually equivalent to a problem in penalized form and vice versa. And we don't know the relationship a priori. It's not easy to determine. But if we're searching for the right tuning parameter, then we can do it in either form. Right? I could either solve a bunch of penalized problems over the tuning parameter lambda or a bunch of constrained problems over t. We would just do whatever's easier, algorithmically, whatever's easier. So really, we should compare it, Frank Wolf, to either the projection operator onto C or the prox operator for the norm. Because we would either do proximal gradient or projected gradient over, like I said, a bunch of different values of the tuning parameter, depending on whichever is easier, the projection operator or the prox operator, typically. So this Frank Wolf update, it applies in constrained form, and it's often simpler than both projection onto the norm ball and the prox operator from the norm ball. So that's important to remember. OK, so I'll just uh, get to the last example we talked about. We talked about uh, L1 and LP being easy to do for nor norm balls. Uh, trace norm we went through kind of quickly. Um, but I'll just say it again, because this is an important one. This is one where Frank Wolf sees a lot of advantages that people are starting to care about, which is that if we have a trace norm regularized problem, where this is the sum of the singular values, so say we're doing matrix completion in constrained form, that's an, ex an example of a problem you might want to solve, then to compute the Frank-Wolf update, all we need to do is compute the top left and right singular vectors of the gradient. The gradient is a matrix in this case, right? Because x is a matrix. Projection onto the, tra onto the trace norm ball requires an SVD. So that's something you can look up. The prox operator for the trace norm, we also learned that we derived that earlier in the class, that requires an SVD. Okay? So both, of those, both the prox and the projection that are associated with the trace norm are much more expensive than this Frank-Wolf update, which is actually a subgradient of the operator norm, because that's the dual norm of the trace norm. Right? So if you, don't, if you haven't seen this kind of stuff in detail, at least it should be intuitive to you that if I ask you to compute the top left and right singular vectors of a matrix versus its whole singular value decomposition, those are very different tasks. Right? Of course, the singular value decomposition includes the top left and right singular vectors and all the rest, so it's a lot harder to do. So this is a lot cheaper in terms of the update. Um, this is just what I said. So I, I said this in words. Constrain the Lagrange form we should really be comparing to both the projection onto the norm ball and the prox operator. I mean, that's just what I said. So a summary um, of what we saw. L1 norm, basically, both the prox for the L1 norm and projection use order and flops. Projection is a little bit more complicated than the prox operator. You can find papers that have kind of these clever order and algorithms for, for projecting onto the simplex or onto the L1 ball. Frank Wolf is very straightforward for this case. It's just order n as well. So it seems like for the L1 norm, you don't really gain much with Frank Wolf. 
But for the LP norm and the trace norm, there's a big difference. So in general, right, we saw that computing a subgradient of the LQ norm, which is the dual of the LP norm, say if, if P and Q are, are dual, that's still order n. We had an explicit form for that. Projecting onto the LP norm, I don't know how to do that in general. I don't think it's known. And I don't know that there's also a prox operator for the LP norm in general. I believe both of those have not been figured out, um, if I'm not mistaken. The trace norm, is both, both the prox and the projection are much more expensive. Okay, so um, these are just three examples of many. Special polyhedra, special cones, sum of norms, uh, atomic norms. All these things have efficient Frank-Wolf updates. Uh, you can take a look at this paper. I list actually two papers by Martin Jaggi, where he gives a bunch of nice examples. So if you're curious, take a look at this. Yeah, Sammy. Uh, there was an awful form of several examples to the two norms. Uh-huh. Uh, how the, the, the approximated Um Yeah, that's a good question. So that's actually fairly easy to do with Frank Wolf, right? So that might be an exercise that um, you could compute, right? But that actually requires an inverse, computing an inverse of Q. It's closed form, but requires the inverse of Q. So depends, I guess, if Q is structured. Good question. OK. Um, yeah, so take a look at that paper if you're curious. So. Um, here's now where we're going to kind of understand the limitations of Frank Wolf. So it's important to see these kind of examples because what we're about to to show and what we uh, what I mentioned at the start of the lecture or the start of the Frank Wolf part last time was that Frank Wolf appears to have when we write it down the same convergence rate that's projected gradient. All right. So if I tell you that it has the same convergence rate and each iteration is much cheaper computationally, it seems like we'd never want to use anything else. Right? We never want to use a first order method in place of Frank Wolf. Well, when you run examples, here's an example, you can actually see that in practice it has a slower convergence than first order methods. Okay, so even though it gets the same rate, even though it has in principle a one over epsilon rate, which we're going to show, or I'm at least going to state, practical examples show that actually each iteration makes less progress in terms of convergence to high accuracy. So I, all I did was I took a constrained lasso problem medium-sized problem, 500 variables and 100 observations. And I ran projected gradient uh, and conditional gradient. In other words, the Frank Wolf algorithm. And I, I used this fast projection operator onto um, the L1 ball, although it doesn't matter because I'm measuring it per iteration here. But you can think about on the, each iteration of Frank Wolf and of projected gradient, they both are order n. And they're, they're both pretty similar computationally. And we can see, first of all, what's the first thing we see? Frank Wolf is not actually a descent method. Okay, this is not, these are not uh, numerical accuracy problems. It's not a descent method. You can see that um, in many examples. So it's called conditional gradient method. The second thing we see is that uh, it actually, it has a lot of trouble getting to the high accuracy regime. I mean, we already know that if I were to plot a second order method here, then it would dominate all of these, but even compared to uh, projected gradient, Frank Wolf appears to be struggling. Okay, so it's it's somewhere, I guess its practical speed appears to be somewhere in between something like a subgradient method and a, and, and a projected gradient method. Uh, and I, 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 an important caveat is that I use fixed step sizes here. So I use the gamma equals 2 over k plus 1. Line search would have helped. But in my experience, I also use a fixed step size here for projected gradient. So in my experience, if you give them both um, line, uh, the ability to do backtracking, then the same kind of rough comparison still holds. So before we talk about uh, the convergence rate, let's talk about a very important property of, of the Frank-Wolf iterates, which is that they admit a very natural duality gap. So it's actually a suboptimality gap, but I'm calling it a duality gap for a reason. And this is something I think that um, maybe was, could have been known earlier, but certainly in Martin Jaggi's PhD thesis, this was featured very prominently. So at least I'll attribute it to him for now. So basically, remember our Frank Wolf problem is to do the following. Our updates are to compute the argument 
of the gradient of f of x transpose s for all, uh, I guess, yeah. This is the problem we solve. And, and I can also write that, right? It's, there's no loss of generality if I were to look at it like this. It's the same problem. If I ask you to minimize the inner product with uh, the gradient, it's the same as maximizing the negative inner product, and this is just a constant. So it's really the same way of writing it, just slightly different formulation. Right? I'm looking for the argument or the argmax. That's why these are all equalities. So this is the Frank-Wolf update. We know how to compute this. It turns out that actually this quantity, the max, not the argmax, just the max, the max is a duality gap. So in other words, um, if I look at f of x minus f star, that's smaller than or equal to this quantity. That's a very important property of, of the Frank-Wolf iterates. Right? Because we're, we're computing this all along, so this is a very, something that comes for free, basically. We don't have to work at all to find um, a valid suboptimality bound or duality gap. So how do we see this? Uh, I have the proof on the slide that's basically two lines. So let's just recall that the first order condition for convexity, right, for f to be convex, say at the point xk minus 1, is that um, if I take any other point and I look at the uh, value of f at that point and also the value that would be assigned to that point under the linear extrapolation around xk, then the linear extrapolation um, is an underestimator for the function, right? So f of s is bigger than or equal to f of x plus the gradient of f of x transpose. I don't know why I have y here. This, I'm sorry, there's a typo. This should just be an s, s minus x, OK? If I minimize both sides over all of the points s in the set c, this is true for all points, right? So if I minimize over all s in the set c, then the left-hand side gives me f star. And the right-hand side gives me uh, basically this f of x plus the minimum of the gradient transpose, I should say, s minus x. If I rearrange this, uh, then it gives me exactly this, this uh, statement right here, that the duality gap, so if I look at f of x minus f of x, uh, x star, that's less than or equal to minus the min of the gradient transpose s minus x, which is the max. Okay, so this thing, if I just move this to the other side and move f star to this side, it gives me this statement here that I wrote down. So why do we call this a duality gap? Um, this, sh this should now be something that you can see at least in a high level without having to think about too hard from our work on duality. Well, if we rewrite the original problem as an unconstrained problem, but with an indicator function, f of x plus the indicator of x lying in the set C, then we can uh, think about its dual. Think about the dual problem. And from our work on duality and conjugates, we know that if we have a sum of two functions, right, f of x plus g of x, and I ask you to derive their dual, then you should be able to do that uh, at least in terms of forming in terms of their conjugates without thinking, because this is a, this is a kind of a gener generic rule we learned. I just take the conjugate of one function and the conjugate of the other, and it's a max problem, and I have it's the maximum minus conjugate of f minus the conjugate of the other, and I evaluate one of them at, say, minus u, and the other one at u. This is this kind of rule we learned. So I'm just reading it off, reading off that rule. This is the dual. Um, if this is an indicator function, its dual is the support function, another thing we learned. The dual of an indicator function is a support function, right? The support function of a set. So the indicator function of a set, of course, just to remind you, it's either 0 or infinity. Something we learned in our lecture on duality conjugates. The, the dual of that is the support function and vice versa, which is the maximum inner product, say, of overall y in the set C of y transpose x. 
So now I can write down the duality gap, literally, between these two problems at the point x and at a point u. I'm not telling you which dual point to use yet. So I'm subtracting this criterion from this one. That is literally the duality gap. If I had a, if I had a dual point x in, uh, primal point x and a dual point u, that would be f of x plus f star of u plus um, the indicator function, uh, sorry, the support function of minus u. If x is uh, primal feasible, then this should be 0. Right? So we're going to actually evaluate at a point x in C. So that doesn't appear. And we're going to use now uh, what we called Fenchel's inequality, which is that f of x plus f star of u is bigger than or equal to x transpose u. That's what we called Fenchel's inequality. That's true for um, any points x and u. It also comes directly out of the definition of the conjugate function. So if you've forgotten all this stuff, then go back and look at it. It should make sense. All these calculations should make sense. And therefore, the dual lower bound of the duality gap is this. Right? It's uh, x transpose u plus the indicator um, the support function, excuse me, evaluated at minus u. And if I, if all I do is I uh, evaluate this point at my current iterate, and I take as the dual point the gradient of f at x, then this is going to give us exactly the claimed gap. Right? If we stick in x transpose the gradient of f of x plus the support function evaluated at the uh, minus gradient, which is the maximum over all s in the point c, of the minus gradient transpose s, then this is equal to the maximum over all points s in the set C. It doesn't matter. I can put that in the max just to make it clear, which is the gap that we claimed. Okay, so this duality gap, you, this gap, we can actually think of as a duality gap for this larger logic. That's why we say duality gap. Okay, so two different ways of seeing that. Um, it's going to give us a bound on the suboptimality of our function at the current iterate. So now we know how to stop Frank Wolf, right? That's one way to stop it. You can think about the iterations proceed as follows. Um, right here. Compute this. Compute actually um, now the gradient of f at x k minus 1 transpose uh, x k minus 1 minus s k minus 1, that's the duality gap. Stop the algorithm if that's small, otherwise make the update. So just stick in a stopping rule right there based on the duality gap. So here's the convergence analysis that I wanted to mention. And I have part of the proof in the slides. For the rest of the proof, it's very straightforward. And take a, you can take a look at the papers I referenced for it. Um, the proof depends on something that uh, Jaggi calls the curvature constant. So um, it's defined as follows. I look at all triplets, x, s, and y in the set C, or really I'm just looking at all points x and s in the set C, and every y that lies on the convex combination between x and s. So take any two points and take the line segment joining them. And what you compute is the difference between um, f of y minus f of x and this uh, gradient term, the gradient of f of x transpose y minus x, okay, along that line segment. Basically, the maximum difference along that line segment, and it's just scaled for no reason by 2 over gamma squared, where gamma is this. Well, this is for a reason. It, it makes the curvature constant scale well in the proof, but it really depends critically on this quantity. Uh, let's try to debunk this in a few ways. First of all, um, is this always positive? Is m always positive? Or let's not even think about m. Is this quantity always positive in the inside? So I want to know, is this true? f of y minus f of x minus 
be great enough of x transpose y minus x. Right. It's always positive because, well, at least when f is convex, which what we're assuming, it's always positive. Because if I rearrange this, it just says that f of y is bigger than or equal to the linear extrapolation given by f. Okay, so that's good. Um, I'm sorry, there's another typo here. It's supposed to be m. When f is linear, if f is a linear function or an affine function, that's equal to its linear extrapolation. Right, so this, this curvature constant would be 0, because every term would be 0 in here. So it's a measure of how curved f is, in some sense. Right, if, if this is um, bigger than 0, then f is curved. And if f is extremely curved, then this is going to be very, very large. It's the maximum kind of curvature in some sense, maximum departure from linearity. This is the departure of the function from its lin linear um, extrapolation around x. This is also called the Bregman divergence. I don't know if people would have seen that in other classes, but this is a, ends up being a very in, important quantity in many different contexts, even in optimization. This, you know, and maybe in another semester, we might talk about mirror descent. I chose not to talk about it this year as, a, as an advanced topic, but mirror descent um, kind of relates to some of this stuff, and it depends critically on this quantity we call the Bregman divergence. OK, so think about this, like I said, as a measure of curvature of the function m, uh, f, over the constraint set c. And with that in mind, let's uh, just kind of go through this result. If we use the fixed step size choice, gamma k is 2 over k plus 1, then after k iterations, we get uh, a suboptimality bound that looks like 2m over k plus 2. Okay, so if we think of this m as a constant, then this is telling us that we get a 1 over k rate or a 1 over epsilon rate, depending on how you want to say it. This is really just the exact same as projected gradient. In fact, even an even stronger result than this can be proved, which is done in Jaggi's paper, which says that actually if you were to compute the duality gap, then after um, this many iterations, you would quit. If you, after order 1 over epsilon iterations, you would quit if epsilon was your exit criterion. So this is a statement about kind of the true suboptimality that, of the function. But even if you'd use the duality gap, you would have quit kind of at the appropriate 1 over epsilon rate. So it looks good, right? It looks like we should, um, we should think of this as not very different from projected gradient. Um, in fact, we can make that uh, relationship even more precise, which is we could ask, how does it compare if you assumed that the gradient was Lipschitz versus if you assumed that um, the function f had a curvature constant m? How do those assumptions compare? Well, um, a simple calculation here, which I think I'm going to skip because we don't have that much time, but you can go through if you're curious, shows that the curvature constant of the function m, uh, of the function f, which is m, it's always less than or equal to the squared diameter of the set C. So this is the biggest distance between any, any two points in C, times L. L is the Lipschitz constant of the gradient. So in other words, if we assume that um, the function has a bounded curvature constant m, then it's really no uh, stronger than assuming that the gradient was Lipschitz. Right, because it's, it's implied by uh, a Lipschitz gradient, as long as the diameter of our set is bounded. And if you think about this also, then you can see that the rates for projected gradient and the rates for um, this Frank Wolf are actually quite similar. So let's, let's actually think about m as, per that last suggestion, this is about. Um, 2 times the diameter squared of C times L over K plus 2. What did the rate for projected gradient look like? Do you guys remember? So it certainly had a K, either K plus 1 or K plus 2 in the denominator. I can't remember. So this was conditional gradient, or Frank Wolf. For projected gradient, It looks like it looked like um, how far we were from optimality. I think there was a two here even. Divided by the step size t times k. I want to say k plus two. I don't know whether it's k plus two or k plus one, but that doesn't really matter. T times k plus two. By the step size, we know 
the maximum step size we can take that's fixed is 1 over L. So let's plug that in. And you see they really match quite um, closely. right? This quantity, in the worst case, is going to be really the same as the diameter if we start really far away from the solution. In fact, this is an upper bound, of course, on the, the distance, the place where we started to optimality. There's not much difference in these bounds, but they perform quite differently in practice. So what does that tell you about these bounds? It tells us that these bounds aren't really telling the full story. You know, the rate is, it's helpful to know, it's certainly helpful to know that Frank Wolf is on par with um, projected gradient. We probably shouldn't dismiss it, but we shouldn't think about it as being practically uh, equivalent in, in any sense in terms of its convergence to high accuracy. I'm going to skip this too. If you're, if you're curious to know how it's proved, go through this slide and, and then take a look at the Jaggy paper. It's very simple. It's probably even simpler, or maybe it's as simple as the projected gradient proof. There's not much sophistication. Compared to what you've seen already, there's not much sophistication. It's, it's straightforward. Here's one property of the Frank Wolf iterates that are important to mention, which is that they're affine invariant. Very different from, from uh, gradient methods. Okay, so we're seeing a lot of different properties between the two. We're seeing certainly some common things like the rate and different properties like this one. Um, remember that we saw that Newton's method was affine invariant, and so were, were things like um, the, the interior point methods should be affine invariant as well. But uh, the gradient methods we saw certainly weren't. We, we know right, that conditioning really affects their performance. This is telling us, um, this slide is telling us very simple sequence of arguments is saying that actually if you were to take your problem and apply a non-singular transformation, then the Frank-Wolf iterates would be the same in either domain. So really, they're in the same way that Newton is, they're affine invariant. Um, and it's fairly easy to see, um, just to go through it quickly, if we, let's define uh, a new coordinate system X prime based on a non-singular transformation A, so an invertible matrix A. Okay, and I'll think about doing Frank Wolf on x prime rather than on x. And I'll think about a new function, which is h of x prime, which is f of a times x prime. Okay, so in this domain, in this, in this new kind of coordinate system, Frank Wolf would proceed according to these two updates. It would just find the minimum or the minimizer of the, the gradient of our function at our current point transpose z subject to z being in the proper constraint set. Well, here, since we've changed coordinates, you can check that the constraint set now is a inverse times c, right? Because in this coordinate system, we have to multiply by a to get to the previous one. So if we multiply z by a, we get that az is in c. So that's why, in other words, z is in a inverse c. OK, and then this update is, is as, as before. So what we're going to claim is that actually, um, this is the exact same update that we saw before. Right? And it's not hard to see because if we were to take the gradient of our function um, with respect to x prime, then we would see that actually by the chain rule, that's a tr transpose the gradient of f with respect to uh, its argument evaluated at ax prime. So we basically get. Uh, a gradient of f here, evaluate ax prime, transpose az from the chain rule. And now all we have to do is make a variable substitution, right? az is x. Um, that tells us that x is in c. And it tells us exactly that this update is equivalent to what would have been made in the previous coordinate system. So it just comes from staring at that and using the chain rule. It's a very uh, simple argument. Even the analysis is, is affine invariant. Affine invariant. So this curvature constant is not going to change in this new coordinate system versus the old one. It's the same argument that I gave up here. Just use the chain rule. You'll see that basically the, um, the chain rule gives us an A. And if we want to switch back to the old coordinate system, then we would basically uh, have to multiply this by A inverse. So they're going to cancel. So the analysis and the algorithm don't depend on, are, not, are unchanged under affine transformations or linear transformations. It's a unique quality. Another thing that's nice about Frank Wolf is that um, it's pretty robust in some sense to inexact updates. 
So we didn't talk about this with, with the gradient method. Um, I think I, I gave you a paper in the slides that gives you an analysis of this. But uh, you could ask something like, what happens if in, instead of applying the true prox operator, I apply some approximation, approximate version of it? Okay, and there's a paper that I, I told you that you could take a look at that proved that you could still get the right rate under certain conditions on how, how bad the approximation is. That's a pretty sophisticated analysis. It's a nice paper. It's a pretty sophisticated analysis. With Frank Wolf, the analysis actually for inexact updates is very, it's almost trivial. It's very straightforward. And the proof is essentially the same as it was before. All that happens if we basically incur an error of delta is that we multiply the right-hand side by 1 plus delta. So it's, in a sense, it's, I think it's fairly robust to uh, inexact updates. Now, when I'm saying robust, all I mean is that the analysis is straightforward. It carries forward from what it was before. I'm not telling you that I think Frank Wolf will handle inexact updates in practice any better than proximal gradient will. I don't know that, actually. That would be interesting to know. Um, one important point is that if you look at how I wrote it, I said, suppose that we, at the step k, instead of choosing sk minus 1 to exactly minimize this quantity, suppose we chose it so that it was within the minimum plus an error. That error looks like m times gamma k over 2 times delta. So m, in, m is a constant. So that doesn't matter. I could have just you know, sucked that into delta. 2 is a constant, obviously. Gamma k is what's important here. I'm thinking of delta as a constant that you fix ahead of time. You say, I'm, I want to you know, fix delta at 0 0.01. And that tells you that basically the suboptimality bound is going to be 1.01 instead of multiplied by 1. But what do you need for that to be true? I need that at every step, the kth step, I optimize to within delta times essentially gamma k of the minimizer. Well, since uh, gamma k goes to 0, right? gamma k looked like 1 over k, it's telling you you need to be more and more accurate as the iterations proceed. So as you get closer and closer to optimality, the uh, inexact updates have to be less and less inexact. The same is true with proximal gradient. It require the errors to vanish over the course of the algorithm. It's an important property. Um, two variants of Frank Wolf that I'll mention. One is backtracking line search. So instead of fixing gamma k to be that that uh, quantity 2 over k plus 1, you could use um, backtracking. I actually wrote down the exact line search here. I don't think there's any reason for that. You could use either. And another very interesting variant that I, we won't have time to talk about is a fully corrective version, which uh, essentially, after you find the point sk minus 1, remember that sk minus 1 was equal to the argmin of the gradient transpose s subject to s lying in the set C. The fully corrective version takes this, and instead of applying this update, as we learned before, which is going to be uh, gamma or 1 minus gamma k times xk minus 1 plus gamma k times sk minus 1. So instead of applying this update, the fully corrective version actually takes xk to be the point that minimizes the function over all points x that are in the convex hull of the points we've seen so far. So x0 all the way through sk minus 1. So each of these are atoms in the sense that's a, a one term people use to them in the sense that they mark the location of the, of the linear minimizers. We collect all those atoms and the initial point, and the fully corrective version basically allows us to choose very greedily the minimizer among this convex hull. So of course, this is much more expensive than the Frank Wolf update. But it allows you to do more than just move a little bit along the convex combination of xk minus 1. And xk minus 1 looks, allows you to look at the full convex hull. So allow previous iterations to have some say in what happens now, too. So some, some approximate versions of this um, have been studied, because this is usually typically hard to do exactly. And they're, they're shown to perform much better than the uh, usual Frank-Wolf updates in some situations. Both of these variants have the same 
complexity, iteration complexity, there's still one over epsilon. So it's some things that could be interesting to, to pursue if you're, if you're interested in Frank Wolf. Um, there's another version, another uh, variant that I'll just write down, which are called backward steps. And I think actually um, Jersey sent out, or somebody, maybe it was Jersey, I thought sent out an email on Piazza saying that there was a, uh, a seminar on Frank Wolf, was it yesterday? Someday this week, that, that talked about um, this variant as well. So maybe you guys can teach me about this if you went to the seminar yesterday. I think it's interesting, I just didn't include it in the slides. Basically, it allows you to, uh, to move, I think, in some sense, opposite to the directions su suggested by the atoms. All right, any questions about Frank Wolf um, before I get to this last little bit? We went through it kind of quickly, but I think the, concept, the idea should be clear, at least. So one way to think about it in your mind is that it's, it's a very efficient method if you're looking for a rough solution. Its iterations are very cheap. You probably can't get much cheaper than that. And it, do, it doesn't even have the same convergence kind of properties practically as gradient descent, although it does theoretically. So if you're looking for something rough, or even as a rough start, uh, a rough solution to start off another algorithm, it's a good place to go, definitely. And if you start using things like this fully corrective version, backward steps, line search, that improves its convergence in practice. All right, so we're going to finish a few more slides on Frank Wolf and then take a break. Um, this is something pretty neat that came out of work after the kind of initial Frank Wolf wave, uh, which is approximate path following of Frank Wolf. I think it's a really nice idea, really simple. And let's think about this norm constraint problem, which is to minimize the function uh, f of x subject to a norm constraint on x. And thinking about this in the statistical context, say, let's suppose we're interested in, this, in the solution for many different values of t, because we're going to think about what's the appropriate amount of regularization. And then maybe we'll use cross-validation or something else to determine what, uh, what properties those solutions had. So we pick, pick some value of t given a bunch of solutions. So we're interested in basically the solution path to this problem, which means the solution as t varies from 0 onwards. And we could do that by just laying down a grid of values. Right? We can choose some dense grid of values over a big range of t's and solve all those problems with Frank Wolf or whatever our favorite method is. We could even use warm starts. And that would give us uh, a discrete set of solutions at a discrete set of points t. But we can actually do more than that with Frank Wolf. And unfortunately, since you didn't vote on the exact path following, you won't hear about how to do more than that in some cases by exactly following the path. But you can take a look at the notes from last year or two years ago. Um, with Frank Wolf, we can do something quite interesting, which is that we can actually calculate um, in a sense, what is the next value of t that we should solve the problem at dynamically so that we guarantee that at this uh, current value of t and every value of t between now and the next point, the duality gap is still smaller than something we specify, say epsilon. So what we're going to produce at the end of the day is a path that is the property that at every point along the path, the duality gap is at most epsilon. So it's, our path, our approximate path is uniformly close to the actual solution path. It's a pretty cool thing. Um, so you, you fix this parameter epsilon, which is how far you want to deviate from the solution path, say you know, 0 0.01 or something. And you fix another parameter m, which should be something that's larger than 1. Um, because you're going to solve inner problems at the accuracy ep epsilon over m. And you're going to repeat the following steps. So first, we're going to start at 0, because assuming this is a norm, if we take t as 0, then the solution is just 0. So we're going to start at 0. It's the easiest place to start. At every step, we're going to calculate what we're going to call like the next value of t, which I call tk, given the previous one, which is just the previous one plus something. And that something is 1 minus 1 of ram times epsilon divided by the gradient of our loss function if I evaluate it at the previous point. So t1 is going to be given by 0 plus 1 minus 1 over epsilon times the gradient of f at 0, 
once I apply the, the dual norm. This tells us how far we can go. And then we're going to set the solution to be exactly the same for every value of t between tk minus 1 and tk. So we're going to actually produce a piecewise constant solution path. You can imagine, let's suppose that we're here. This is tk minus 1. And we have this solution x hat tk minus 1. Then we computed this next value, tk. And it was computed in such a way that we're guaranteeing that if I just were to stay where I was exactly, so I would keep the solution constant, my approximate solution constant between tk minus 1 and tk. So in other words, I set um, my guess at the solution to be just what, what I saw at tk minus 1 for all t between tk minus 1 and tk, then I have the property that suboptimality gap is less than or equal to epsilon along this segment. So I'm not really hurting myself by just pretending that the solution is constant and not actually resolving in this, in this interval. Now, tk, I have to solve again. That's the, what I do next. I solve again. Maybe the solution actually is this. And then I'm going to compute tk plus 1. And actually, it could be that I only can move a little bit. Right? And, I, and I, I guarantee that if I have to keep the solution at whatever I computed for tk to be the same between these two segments, then the suboptimality gap would be still less than or equal to epsilon. And I continue doing this. So we actually don't know a priori the length of these segments, right, or the locations of these segments. These are determined adaptively at each step. And how do we get these solutions? Well, these solutions at each of these points are computed by Frank Wolf. So each of these guys at tk minus 1, tk and tk k plus 1, I use Frank Wolf. With Accuracy epsilon over m. So I'm going to terminate when I have actually a more than epsilon accurate solution at these points. Is the strategy clear? Maybe not the reason why it's true, but just the strategy itself. OK, so why is it true? It's actually quite simple. Um, we're going to prove it on the next slide. Why is it the case that when I do this, do I get a, the property that if I were to keep the solution the same, is the duality gap always less than epsilon? Well, um, the duality gap we can compute right from Frank Wolf. And if you look at it as a function of t, which we're going to do, you're going to see it's actually a linear function of t. And so at each of these points, I know the duality gap is, at, is epsilon over m at most. And it's a linear function of t. So as I increase t, the duality gap is going to grow from epsilon over m. And at some point, it's going to hit epsilon. So at some point, this linear function is going to hit epsilon when it starts at epsilon over m. All I want to do is I want to stop it once it hits epsilon. If I do that, then I've guaranteed that at every point between where I started off and where I am now, the duality gap is going to be less than or equal to epsilon. If I take it any farther, then I'm going to be in trouble. I'll violate my duality gap. And determining how far to go is very easy because it's a linear function. So once I know that it's epsilon over m at some point, I know, and I asked how far I can go for it to be epsilon, it's a very simple calculation, and it just comes out to be this. So this is the, this is the uh, argument here. Um, the duality gap, remember I told you it's the, I'm sorry, this is another typo. I've had a few typos this lecture. This should be the maximum over all s who have norm less than or equal to t at the point t. That's the duality gap that we learned of the gradient transpose x minus s. And if I just uh, unfold it like I had it before, this is the gradient transpose x plus, what is this? This is um, equal to the max of the gradient. Let's write this out so that it's clear. The duality gap is max overall s that are less than or equal to 1 of the gradient 
of f of x transpose x minus s. And uh, this should be t, which is equal to the gradient of f transpose x plus this is equal to the max over all s that have norm less than or equal to t of the gradient of f of x transpose minus s. Right, but I can actually I can actually just change this with an s, because um, if I reparameterize and I call s v or something, right, then this becomes a v, and this becomes that the norm of minus v is less than or equal to t, but that's the same as the norm of v being less than or equal to t. Right, this constraint set symmetric, so I could have put s or minus s here, another way of saying it. And if I look at the points for which um, the norm is less than or equal to t, it's the same as t times the points for which the norm is less than or equal to 1. So that's why the t comes out. And now, this, you can see this is exactly the dual norm of whatever this quantity is, gradient. So as a function of t, what is it? It's linear, right? Constant, constant, and that's where t appears. So we can see that the duality gap actually acts linearly as a function of t. And so if, at, if I had some point x for which the duality gap was epsilon over m, and it increases at this prescription as a function of t, I just want to solve for when this is equal to epsilon. And if I do that, you can see, look, I'm solving for the duality gap um, to be equal to epsilon. You'll see that I, I exactly get, um, did I write it down here? Yeah, if I solve this equal to epsilon, once I know that it's at epsilon over m at the point x, this is the value of, of t at which I get. It crosses epsilon. OK? And that's, that's the entire argument. So if you take a look at these papers that I referenced, this one by Giesen, for example, example, they do it for much more complicated situations. And they actually, I think they do it in a bit of a strange way. Um, so it may, it may look much more confusing from those papers. It could be also the case that their path is more efficient than the one that I, I wrote down here. Uh, in my experience with this path, it's kind of, um, maybe it fits in with what I know about Frank Wolf, which is that you don't move very far because you don't have that high accuracy at any point. So the path ends up uh, you know, giving you these incremental advances. So it has the property that the duality gap is guaranteed to be bounded along the way, but it's actually less efficient than if you just laid down a bunch of t's and solves. Now, of course, you have a stronger guarantee than that, because you actually have a path guarantee than just a pointwise guarantee, but I have not found this to be more efficient. However, this is my kind of uh, interpretation or, or my spin on, the, on Frank Wolf path following, and these ones are much more complicated. It could be the case, because I have not compared them, that for with their setup, they get kind of longer steps along the path. So don't, so don't be misled if you look at these papers and they look different. OK. Um, that's it for Frank Wolf. Any questions? You guys have been a little quiet. I did go pretty fast, but any questions about Frank Wolf? OK, let's take a break. We might as well start. Um, I guess we'll just go through at a very high level what it's about. Poor proximal Newton was voted out. It's not going to get the same say that the other lectures did, but um, it's it's honestly should be something that you understand fairly well, given that you understand proximal gradient. Um, it's just that uh, there are some subtleties. So if you go to apply proximal Newton, I'd recommend you read all the slides before you go do that. Don't just use these 20 minutes <clears throat> to base your decisions off of. So we're coming back to proximal gradient again. Remember, we saw what kind of projected gradient, which is a special case of proximal gradient, and how we could do something else differently with Frank Wolf. This is uh, coming back to proximal gradient again and seeing how we can do things differently. And the proximal gradient approach, remember, it looked at um, smooth plus kind of simple functions, both of which were convex. And it applied the prox operator of this function, h, repeatedly to the gradient set that we would make under g. And this prox operator is defined as follows. It's the minimizer of the problem that looks for the, uh, to minimize the square distance between x and z scaled plus h of z. 
This is called the prox operator associated with H. And just to remind you, things that you know maybe you should still have in your head, but you may have forgotten. The difficulty here in applying the prox only depends on H. There's nothing here to do with G. And that dominates the computational cost typically at each iteration. Okay, per iteration, that may be the most expensive thing. We typically think of it that way. So that as long as we can compute this gradient, the prox operator uh, only depends on H, and that determines the difficulty of the problem, of, the, of applying the algorithm. And it has the same convergence rate as fully smooth gradient descent, so if we didn't have any H. And so it's good to use when the prox is efficient. That was the quick summary of proximal gradient. The motivation was that it uh, basically minimized at every step a quadratic expansion of G plus H, plus the original H. So because H wasn't smooth, we actually don't make an expansion to it. We just make a quadratic expansion of G plus H. And in that quadratic expansion of G, you can see, the Hessian we replaced by a multiple of the identity. So it's really a linear expansion plus a squared error term between Z and X. What was the fundamental difference between Newton's method and gradient descent? It was that, well, think about them both in this context. They both minimized iteratively quadratic approximations. But gradient descent used this one. Didn't have any H, but it used this one. And Newton's method used the Hessian. Instead of actually using a scaled version of the identity, it used the Hessian of the function. So it was a better quadratic approximation in some sense, in terms of how accurate it was. So now you might think, what happens if in the proximal world, we did the same? We replaced this by the Hessian of our function. Right? It should be the, the analogy of Newton to gradient descent, but in the proximal world. That's called proximal Newton method. We're just going to replace that with the, the Hessian of the smooth part G. And uh, that's you know, something that uh, I think is a, was a you know, quite old idea that, again, people have revisited in some recent years. So first, we're going to define what we call the scaled prox. The scaled prox, it looks very similar to what we saw before, except I put an h here instead of the 2 norm. And this h norm, we're just going to define as uh, if you ask for the squared h norm of a point x, it's x transpose hx. So when x, h is the identity, this is just the L2 norm. Otherwise, it's like a Mahalanobis distance. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Sorry, should be an, an x. Right, so the norm of h norm of x squared is x transpose hx for a positive definite matrix h. This is what we're going to call the scaled prox, the guy that uses this as a measure of distance between x and z rather than just the identity matrix, or really the identity matrix over t. If, you, if we took h to be 1 over t times identity, you'd see this is actually the prox we saw before. It's a generalization of the prox we saw for gradient descent. And now we're going to do uh, the analogy of Newton's method, but in the proximal world, which is that we're going to take a Newton step with respect to g. So I've just written its Hessian as h uh, k minus 1, just for simplicity. And then we'll imply the scaled prox, so again defined in terms of the Hessian, and then we'll, we'll perform the usual update. OK, and the, the, um, the step sizes here we're going to choose by backtracking. So we're going to update x in the direction given by this proximal minimizer. And as with Newton, uh, a tempting choice is to take the pure step, so step size tk equals 1, but that doesn't necessarily converge, so we're going to have to use backtracking. All right, the method clear? OK, so let's just first check that this is indeed minimizing the quadratic approximation of g plus h, where the quadratic approximation uses the Hessian. So this was our prox problem. I just wrote it out. We're going to minimize the distance between the Newton step with respect to g minus z, measured in the h norm squared, plus h of z. So remember, the h norm is just this transpose h times itself. So when we write that out, you can see, well, first of all, the term that depends only on g of x, we can throw out because the minimum over z. The term that looks like the cross term between these two, we're going to have an h times an h inverse, and that's going to cancel. So it's going to give us 
the gradient transpose z minus x. And the term that looks like x minus z, uh, when we expand it, is going to have an h in between, given the nature of this norm. So we'll get z minus x transpose h z minus x, and h of z stays there. So this is indeed a quadratic approximation, where instead of using the identity here, we've used the Hessian. So when h is 0, of course, this gives us the, the usual Newton update. So it's like the relationship between proximal gradient and gradient. You can think of it as a generalization to Newton. When h is positive semi-definite, you can check that the, this prox operator, which uh, we denote by prox h, and I think I said we'll call the scaled prox, it has many of the nice properties as the usual prox operator. So it's um, non-expansive. You can think about it like a generalized projection. It inherits a lot of these properties. Uh, one very kind of simple one is that it's well-defined. Okay, we have to even make sure that it's well-defined. Is, is there a unique minimizer here? Well, that is the case because when h is positive semi-definite, this is strictly convex. This term is strictly convex in z. So strictly convex plus convex is going to give us a unique minimizer. And here's an interesting kind of twist on what uh, happens in proximal Newton. The difficulty of the prox is mostly to do with h. Right? It's mostly the case that h is going to determine the difficulty here. However, the smooth part still plays a role. And that is it plays a role through its Hessian. So the structure of the Hessian could, could actually influence the difficulty of this subproblem a lot. So with a gradient, when, when we all were using the gradient, the gradient was sparse or dense. It didn't matter. Really, the prox didn't change in difficulty for proximal gradient. Now we're looking at the gradient and the Hessian. And the Hessian is serving as kind of the quadratic form in this problem. So this is minimized a generic quadratic you know, an arbitrary Hessian in some sense, plus a linear term, plus uh, a non-smooth function. And now, if h is structured, this may be much easier than when it's dense. Certainly, when h is diagonal, we know it should be easy, because that's just the prox operator from gradient descent. So the Hessian of g does play a role. So not quite as um, black and white as it is with proximal gradient as to what makes these inner problems difficult. Backtracking, we do as we always do. We um, propose the update direction v. And uh, actually, I'm, I take that back. It's not as we always do. This is going to be a little different from what you've seen before. This part looks like what you've seen before, which is that we propose a starting point, say, t equals 1. And we, we try to check whether or not um, we are less than or equal to some fraction of what we get from the linear extrapolation. So alpha is just some constant here, like 0.5. Measure with respect to the smooth part. And if all we had was a smooth part, then you see this is the exact backtracking rule for Newton, these first two terms. This is Newton's backtracking rule. Now with the non-smooth part, we also add in this term, which is um, the difference between the it's non-smooth part as our proposed update minus where we are times alpha. So we're asking for a fraction of increase, basically, with respect to both the smooth part and its linear extrapolation and the non-smooth part. This is not the only rule that we can use for proximal Newton, but it's, uh, it's probably the most efficient backtracking rule that we could use, because you can see throughout backtracking, we never have to recompute the prox. So if we had to recompute the prox at every interloop of backtracking, that might be disastrous, because we haven't talked about how difficult the prox is yet, but you can imagine it's difficult, given the dense Hessian. And so you can see that v only needs to be computed once here. If this is not met, I just shrink t, and I just compare again. There's a different way to do backtracking, which is sometimes called um, backtracking arc search for this problem, which requires that we recompute the prox at every step. That'll have us exit backtracking quicker. And that'll actually be completely analogous to what we did with proximal gradient. If you look at proximal gradient, if you look back at the slides, the backtracking that we did there, at every step, it had us recompute the prox. We changed it for Newton, because that would have been too expensive. But, but, um, but you can think about either one. So now we should get to the point where we should think whether this even makes sense. Of course, we can write down proximal Newton. We can think about it has analogous properties to proximal gradient and to Newton, and so it's this nice combination. But 
does this make sense to use? Our main motivation for using proximal gradient was that we took a problem that looked like this, g of x plus h of x, and we turned it to a sequence of problems where we replaced g by something like this, b minus the norm of x squared. That's what we're doing, right? Because when we're minimizing the prox, the prox problem, it's minimizing a problem that looks like this, but where I've replaced this by a constant minus x squared. And presuming that's cheap, I'm happy to do that over and over again, iteratively. And it'll give me the minimum of this. OK, it can be easy, depends on h. Proximal Newton is doing the same thing, but it's actually turning this into a sequence of problems where we replace g by b transpose x plus a tran x transpose ax, or a is a matrix. So it's actually not just this simple least squares quadratic, but a kind of generic quadratic. Why should we think that's any easier than this problem? Right? It may be the case, actually, that's no easier than our original problem. So proximal Newton doesn't even make sense. In general, this can be a very hard problem. It seems to kind of defeat the spirit of proximal gradient. Because the subproblem is not easy for a generic Hessian. Okay, so it's an important pause to make. So this is all true. Nothing was um, misleading about that last slide. In fact, you can think about it. Suppose H is the L1 norm, right? A common choice. What would the prox be for an proximal Newton? It would be a full lasso problem. The equivalent to doing a full lasso problem where the design matrix was, X, was A. We know that's not easy. Right? That requires solving it with another algorithm, say, you know, proximal gradient, as we learned, or coordinate descent, et cetera. So what we should hope for if we're going to think about applying proximal Newton is that the convergence rate is like Newton, which means that even though we have to solve this hard prox, we should only have to solve it a few times before we get to a very accurate solution. If proximal Newton had the same convergence properties as proximal gradient, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Because we made these subproblems super hard, and we need a lot of them. Fortunately, it turns out to be the case that, as you would hope, uh, in many, in kind of under broad conditions, proximal Newton has the same convergence rate in terms of number of iterations required as Newton. So it's really doing something analogous to proximal gradient, but you're doing something in a very different regime. You're solving pretty hard subproblems, where each subproblem is given by a quadratic expansion. But because you've used the Hessian properly in that quadratic expansion, you only typically need very few to get an accurate solution. So in other words, you need to only solve the prox a handful of times in order to get the accurate solution. And you really should be relying on the fact that you have a good algorithm for the inner prox. Right? You would never apply this if you didn't. So in general, it shouldn't be applied without care, because that inner problem, you need to think about how you would solve efficiently, because you're going to need to do it a bunch of times, but not as many as you know pro proximal gradient, on the order of Newton iterations. And there are a few well-known implementations that use proximal Newton, Glimnet and Quick. I'm not going to have time to talk about them. Just take a look at the slides if you're, if you're curious. These two things, I'd say, are pretty close to state of the art with respect to their own problem um, that they solve. And they both use proximal Newton. OK, convergence analysis, it gets the same convergence rate as Newton in terms of outer iterations. OK, so it's log, log, 1 over epsilon, local rate. So it's a locally quadratic convergence rate. Each iteration uses the scaled prox. So that's important to remember. We're, remember. we're counting number of iterations here. These are the same conditions we put down for Newton. They're no different. Not the self-concordant analysis, but the original analysis, these ones right here. Um, I'm going to skip through the proof scats, skip through Glimnet and Quick. Uh, let me just tell you this, which is important. So when you go to apply proximal Newton, unlike proximal gradient, your prox evaluations will almost always be inexact. Right? Because the subproblem you're solving is not one that when we go to apply, we have a direct uh, form for. Unlike proximal gradient, where we typically figure out that the prox is soft thresholding, or it's truncation, or it's something simple. Um, here, the inner proxes, right, the inner iterations, they require running an optimization procedure. So we're almost always faced with the prospect that we're going to have to evaluate the prox inexactly. And 
fortunately, um, if you use an accurate algorithm for that inner subproblem, it'll still retain all of the convergence properties as proximal Newton if the procs were exactly evaluated. And uh, here is a nice example to, sh to show that just in practice. Um, I took this from this paper on proximal Newton. Here are the two convergence uh, plots. Let's look at the blue and the, and the red for now. Between the convergence analysis for the exact uh, inner problems being solved, so again, they can't really do them exactly. Here they're just solving them to extremely high accuracy. So they're not caring about computational time as much. And they're using an adaptive method which stops when you have a pretty good solution to that inner prox problem. You can see that the convergence plots overlap exactly because they've been very careful here about purporting, um, about quitting the, the inner prox optimization when they have kind of an accurate enough solution, but not, not a fully exact solution. And in terms of time, it is a lot better too, obviously, if we don't solve the inner proxies exactly. Okay, so um, if you're interested, take a look at this slide. This slide will tell you a rule to, to stop the inner optimizations that still has a guaranteed Newton uh, convergence rate. So if you, if you stop the iterations when you have an approximate solution to the prox uh, that's, uh, whose quality is dictated by this rule, then you're guaranteed that you'll still have a local quadratic convergence rate. All right, um, here's, now we have a, maybe just a minute. I'll just quickly say that um, this is commonly done in practice when people have very good algorithms for solving those, those inner prox problems. So an example to keep in mind is uh, we have very good algorithms for solving the lasso problem with, with uh, Gaussian regression loss. That algorithm is core and descent. We talked about how efficient it was uh, you know, a few lectures ago. If the loss is logistic regression, so you want to solve a big sparse logistic regression problem, you cannot write down the coordinate descent steps exactly. You cannot minimize each coordinate descent step exactly. Even though your algorithm for the Gaussian case was super fast, you're now kind of stuck, even though you, you love all the tricks about coordinate descent. So what, what we do in that case, and what's done in GlimNet and other, other uh, implementations as well, is that you make a quadratic approximation to the logistic regression loss that uses the Hessian. Each inner subproblem is then a fully dense lasso problem. And you solve that with coordinate descent because coordinate descent is your hammer and you know that it work, works well. Even though that inner solve is pretty expensive, it's a good algorithm for that problem and you can solve it to high accuracy. So if you do this properly, then the whole thing will converge in say five to 10 iterations if you're lucky because it has a Newton-like convergence once it gets to the kind of the right regime. So that's an example where proximal Newton is applied to give you a sense of it. That's the GlimNet package um, that people commonly use for L1 penalized generalized linear models. In fact, the authors of that package, they're so confident in proximal Newton that they actually don't even do backtracking line search. When you go to use that package, they use unit uh, steps, which I think is pretty surprising, but that's the implementation. They just use unit steps because it works so well. Um, quick as another example, if you came to a, a talk, one of the job talks by our ML candidates um, a week ago, he was one of the main authors on Quick, which does a very similar thing, but for large uh, graphical models. All right. That was proximal Newton in 20 minutes. We skipped projected Newton, so take a look if you're interested. Next week, I guess we'll do fast stochastic stuff and non-convex stuff. And, oh, remember to turn in your project reviews. You're supposed to be doing these project referee reports by, I think it's tomorrow night.